All right, check this out. I'm currently logged in as a normal user. I don't have full access to this machine, but if I run this program, bam, all of a sudden I'm a root user. I've got full access to this machine. Pretty cool, right? This video is gonna be a story and a technical explanation behind this vulnerability that lets attackers gain high privileged access. This video is sponsored by Sneak. Sneak scans your projects for known vulnerabilities in code, dependencies, containers, and even configurations. Go try it out at sneak.co slash potent function. About 12 years ago, this piece of code was pushed to a particular Linux package. And little did we know, this was gonna be a major bug in many Linux operating systems. And about two months ago, the storms of Log4j vulnerability was clearing out. And just when people were starting to settle, the security team from Qualys dropped this research. It's a local privilege escalation, meaning that if you're a regular low privileged user, you can become root or an administrator without any credentials. Pretty cool, right? This is kind of a big deal because anywhere from penetration testers to malwares could use this in good and bad ways. The word authorization in Linux systems would actually lose its meaning. The research also stated that most Linux distributions like Ubuntu, Debian, Fedora, CentOS, all of them were pretty much affected, all because they shipped one vulnerable package pre-installed. So this code is from the package poll kit or policy kit. It comes pre-installed in many Linux distributions, meaning that a lot of machines were vulnerable at that point in time. So the vulnerable code that you saw was found in an executable named pkxec, which is part of the uh, policy kit suite of tools. But what exactly is pkxec and what does it really do? pkxec is an executable that allows one user to execute commands as another user, kind of like sudo. Now you might have used sudo before, which gives you root access to non-root uh, programs, right? Similarly, pkxec can also provide these privileges to unprivileged programs. Now the question is, what went wrong? To understand that, we need to look into some source code. Before we get into the real meat, you should know some things about arguments. So let's check them out real quick. So let's say that you run a program like cat and you provide test.txt as an argument. So the entire argument array is gonna look something like this. Here the cat is the first argument, the index zero. Uh, the first arguments are usually gonna be the name of the uh, program itself. In our case, it's cat. Uh, and the second argument is the file name that we just provided, test.txt, with the index one. And these are all strings, by the way. But in memory, the arguments of a process look something like this. So you've got a bunch of arguments stacked at one place, and then the environment variables are right next to it. So first comes the uh, list of arguments, and then comes the list of environment variables. So far, so good. Now think about a question. What really separates the arguments from the environment variables? Like what's really the boundary here? This is an important question because the memory is contiguous. So there's gotta be a definitive boundary or else everything's just gonna go south. So there is a boundary here and that's null. If the last element of the arguments is null, that means that's where the arguments end and the environment variables begin. Remember that. So consider our previous cat example. So here, the third element of the array is gonna be null, and that's where the arguments end and the environment variables begin. Great, now that you're familiar with how the arguments are structured in memory, we can understand the vulnerability. Let's continue. So let's just dive right into pkexec.c. Here's a loop that starts with the variable n set to one, and it checks for the arguments provided to the pkexec program at runtime, such as, you know, dash dash help or whatever. A few lines down, we'll see this. This is basically reading the nth argument and setting it to the variable path. And a few more lines down the road, we see this. Here, it fetches the program's path 
and it sets it back to the arguments array. Hmm, interesting. But have you spotted the problem yet? Well, here it is. If you have not provided any arguments, but we set the zeroth element in the arguments array to null, which is usually supposed to be the name of the program, but now it's null. What do you think would actually happen here? Well, let's walk the code. Initially, n becomes 1 from this uh, loop. Since it doesn't really match any case, it would break out of this loop with the value n set to 1. You gotta remember that. Down here, it's trying to read the arguments of n, which is basically 1. And we already know that it doesn't exist because we just set the arguments 0 to null. That means the arguments should end there, but regardless, this line of code is still trying to read something that's out of bound. So when it's doing this out of bounds read, what do you think it's actually trying to read? Exactly, it's the environment variables. Remember earlier we discussed that how the memory is laid out for arguments and the environment variables, they were basically stacked right next to each other. So here, when it's trying to read the second argument, it's in fact trying to read the first environment variable. This value is stored as the path variable and ergo an out of bounds read. Also, if the path variable doesn't start with a forward slash, it writes the path back to arg v of n, and that's an out of bound write. So now we have two weird behaviors that we can somehow take advantage of. These uh, weird behaviors are also called as primitives. Uh, so with these primitives, we can inject any environment variable into a process. But you might be like, hold up, all this for just to set the environment variable of a process? I mean, we could literally do that by hand, right? What's the big deal? Yes, we can add an environment variable when we start the process, but there is a caveat. There are some interesting environment variables to be considered, and those are called unsecure environment variables. So something like LD preload. So that's an environment variable which is automatically filtered by LDSO on any set UID bit programs or programs that run as another user. If they aren't filtered, it's an easy privilege escalation, but Linux is aware of these attacks and hence it restricts some environment variables to be passed down uh, from parent to a child process. So we can't really inject all kinds of environment variables, but since we have this new primitive of out of bounds right, we should be able to use it to inject insecure environment variables like LD preload and gain root privileges, right? Uh, pretty much, yes, but there's one small problem. Right after this out of bounds right, it calls clear env, which means it clears out every environment variable. So we need to find a way to execute the code from the point where it does the out of bounds right, but before it clears out all the environment variables. So that's the, that's the execution frame that we've got, and we gotta find something interesting within that frame. So let's take a look at the code again. Right after the out of bounds write, there's a call to this interesting function called validate environment variables. So inside this function, there's a conditional call to gprint error. This function is kind of important because it's like our main gadget. Basically, this function helps us uh, in getting privilege escalation. Here's how. So this gprint error function normally prints UTF-8 error messages. But if the char set is not UTF-8, it would actually call another function called iconvopen from glibc. So this will actually try to convert the error message into the right uh, char set using a conversion module. So here's where the gold is. We have full control over this conversion module. So this is basically a shared library. The idea is to trigger an error and set the char set to something that's other than UTF-8, which will trigger this gprint error. So this gprint error function will recognize that the char set is different and it would try to convert them. And to do that, it requires a conversion module, which we can specify using an environment variable called gconvpath. 
So an internal function called gIconvOpen is responsible for the conversion. And this will basically look into the environment variable and get the malicious conversion module from there. Once it has our conversion module, it would try to convert uh, the char set. But in reality, it's actually executing our malicious code. And more importantly, it's executing it as root. Just so you know, just like LD preload, GCONV path is also considered unsecure. But the out of bounds write uh, primitive will actually help us inject uh, the environment variable back in. All right, let's craft the full exploit. As you already know, the main goal is to escalate the privileges from a regular user to a root user. Uh, we have two primitives, a out of bound read and an out of bound write. Uh, with this, we can read and write environment variables, including the insecure environment variables. And we can't use something like LD preload because all the environment variables are cleared out. But we found a special gconv path environment variable that will be triggered before uh, all the environment variables are cleared out. So a perfect candidate. So the idea is to inject the insecure environment variable gconv path, uh, which lets us configure a conversion module, which is basically our malicious uh, shared library. So firstly, we will create a directory named gconv path equals dot and place an empty executable named pwn inside of it. We're doing this because we want gconv path equals to dot forward slash pwn to be written as the first environment variable using our out of bounds write primitive. And uh, we need to make sure that this has to be a valid uh, path returned from the uh, g find program in path function. So hence we name the folder as gconv path equals to dot and then the pwn as a valid executable inside that folder. Then we run the pkexec providing our environment variables. We set the first environment variable to pwn. Uh, the out of bounds read will actually read the first argument which is gonna be envp of zero. Uh, so pkexec tries to find the file named pwn. Then we supply term equals two dots. Uh, this will actually trigger the gprint error because it wants to print uh, to the screen that this is a suspicious input. So when it does that, it would actually trigger the whole execution tree. So it would print the error message using the gprint error. Next, we provide path uh, equal to the malicious directory that we just created. When pkexec tries to find the executable pwn, it will try to actually search in a path. And uh, it's, it's doing that using the function find program by path. So we're sending the path environment variable to our directory such that it would actually find that uh, executable inside there. And it would return a valid value, which looks something like this. That's exactly what we want to be written to the environment variable. Right down here, it tries to write this thing back to arguments of one, but as we already know, arguments of one is the environment variables of zero. Basically, we've injected that string into the first element in the environment variables array. Finally, we set the char set to br to trigger the code path that thinks that this is not UTF, and it would try to do the conversion. When it tries to do the conversion, uh, it tries to look inside the uh, directory named pwn uh, because that's where it gets the conversion module from. Cool. So we create a directory named pwn and inside that we create a single file named gconv-modules. This file is like a mapping. So this file basically says if the char set is not UTF-8, then use this module to convert it. So this conversion module will be our malicious code. A conversion module usually requires a few methods to work, like gconv init and gconv. So we'll add our own code inside of the init method. So basically we do a simple shell execution. We also set the UID and GID to zero. This is because usually UID and GID are dropped when we switch the users or run as a different user. So we want to set it back to zero because that's the UID and GID of root. So 
finally we execute the bin sh and all there's left is to compile the uh, shared module and also compile the exploit itself and uh, pretty much run it. So to do that, I would use something like make file. So let's try to run this and uh, sweet, we are root, there we go. By the way, the full code uh, is available on the uh, GitHub repository if you wanna try checking it out. I've also left some comments explaining the code path, so check it out if you have any sorts of confusions or whatever. Now, the real question is, why did nobody see this vulnerability? It's been like 12 years, and why was it not found before? The answer is, it was found. It was found in like 2013 by this person named Ryron. He blogged about this out of bounds, read and write uh, with the arguments in his blog post named argv silliness. He just couldn't exploit this behavior back then, but he did figure out the right root cause. And then in 2019, there was this blog post on a CTF challenge where you had control over the second argument of a fopen function and you had to get code execution from it. And this involved playing around with gconv conversion modules. So theoretically, if you had put those two pieces together, you might have had yourself a zero to exploit, man. I don't know. Uh, but thanks to Qualys, uh, now we know about this vulnerability and there are a lot of fixes. So please update Polkit on your machines. Uh, it should automatically do it like on Ubuntu or whatever. But if you cannot update it, uh, just straight up remove the uh, PKXec executable. And if you're deploying uh, applications using containers, and if it's like vulnerable to the pwn kit, uh, use something like sneak CLI to detect it and fix the issues. Uh, so for example, I've got this Docker image. You can try the attack on this Docker image if you want. Also, the Docker file is available on the GitHub repository. Uh, you can, you know, attack safely inside a container. But anyways, uh, if I run sneak CLI against this image, it would immediately show me the vulnerability that exists inside this container image. So something like this uh, in your uh, development or ops pipeline would be you know, very useful, I think. Anyways, hope you all learned something new. Hope you enjoyed it. Shout out to Sneak again for sponsoring this video. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.